We are here at EAA AirVenture Oshkosh 2019 to celebrate one thing and to find out some more detail. The thing is this young gentleman standing next to me who flew a mighty long way to get here and flew into Oshkosh, which is an activity that some very seasoned pilots are frightened of. And here's a young fellow that pulled it off very well. It's been a quite a eye-opening experience for many that he was able to achieve this. I'm Dan Johnson talking to William Scott and Henry Scott. William, you're the dad. You yep. had sort of the lead role in this in a way. Not the most important role because you weren't at the joystick. No. Nope. But you had a very important role. Tell me a little bit about what you two tried, you three, because your daughter was part of that. Her name yep. is Alina? Alina, yeah. Alina. So William, Henry, and Alina all came out here together, a little family expedition. Yep. Except Henry had the great seat. Yep. He had Tell the, me a little uh, bit about it. Well, uh, sometimes people ask me where did, where did he come up with the idea, and I I can't think of the time when we it, it wasn't obvious what to do. You know, <laughs> it was we'd get an airplane and fly to Oshkosh. That was the first thing that ever occurred to me. Um, it wasn't some sort of like, hey, let's think, think about what do we do after. We, no, learn to fly for the purpose of flying to Oshkosh. So that, that was the whole point of teaching him how to do this. Um, it started back a couple years ago when we taught him how to fly, or he was taught how to fly a powered paraglider, ah. which he flew last year in Oshkosh. Um, and so the obvious progression was to move up to a fixed wing aircraft. And I've been eyeballing the, the Aerolite 103 since he was eight years old uh, because, well, it was there and he liked the, you know, we looked at it and said, You remember it from that time? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It was back at Sun and Fun. Remember, you were about two feet shorter uh, back then. Yeah, you guys uh, are kind of looking eye to eye now. Yeah, here, I, so I joked that soon he'll be taller than I am, you know, but uh, I think that's already passed. Um, so uh, we we had been eyeballing the, the Aerolite since then. It had all the conventional controls of a normal aircraft. And I figured it would be the best thing to learn how to do, uh, to fly a, a, a conventional style aircraft because you know his his ambitions are to move up to the to the Air Force Academy, then the Air cool. Force, and then on to uh, he wants to fly to Mars. He wants to be one of Excellent. the first people to go to Mars. I hope you achieve yeah. that, Henry. Yep. So uh, uh, that was the genesis of the idea. Um, just before last year, we ordered the Aerolite from Dennis, and uh, it came this uh, this year in the in the winter, like in um, January. I think we got it. Okay. February. Oh, it's that new. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. So we got in January or February. Meanwhile, I had been training him in my Cessna 150. Okay. And we've been going through all of the all the ins and outs of flying, how to uh, all all the flying dynamics, all the things that you would have to do. Uh, I think it's under part uh, 6187, you know, whatever. Right. You know, the 13 different things you need to learn. And he had learned them all. In fact, he was essentially flying the Cessna uh, without my input at all from you were from, just there. Yeah, he turned on he turned it on taxi take off navigated communicated Landed and moored the aircraft all without my input. So we'd gotten to that point and now once we got the Aerolite it was a matter of uh, the transition from the Cessna Transitioning the skills he had learned from the Cessna into the Aerolite. So um, I had learned uh, from a guy named Tom Richards a uh, a technique, and I'm sure he didn't invent it, but I understand the French invented this crow hopping uh, technique where essentially we had him go back and forth down a private grass runway, uh, you know, first at very slow speeds, just driving it as you would a, a, an ATV, uh, and then slightly faster and faster until the front wheel came off, and then faster and faster until the rear wheels got light, and then he got a little bit of airborne, then would pull the throttle back and land and do that over and over again until uh, he essentially learned how to fly within five feet of the ground. Um, then one day, I think it was it was February something or other, a couple, couple of weeks before your birthday, um, so he was 13, where we were like, well, we've learned it all, and we went out to Warrington Air Park. There you go, the moment and, of truth, huh? Yep, and put the throttle down and went in the pattern and uh, he cool. finished it. You know, it How'd was, that go? I went smoothly, yeah. No problem, huh? On that very first flight solo? No problem, Sam. All right, good for you. Yeah. So, um, the the after getting, one thing was to just get out there and do lots of flying. Sure. Um, 
No. Nothing like practice. Yeah. No matter so, how good you are. So we, we, we made a sort of a habit of every weekend or as often as we could to get out to the to the airfield and um, and fly, even if it was just going around in circles. Meanwhile, I was doing lots of sort of analytical stuff, like figuring out what the fuel burn rate was and, and noodling with carburetors and propellers and things that, that were more mechanically oriented, sort of with the, with the eye on his uh, ultimate trip to uh, Oshkosh. Um, and from his standpoint, it was just getting more and more stick time to make sure, sure that he sure. had, uh, um, you know, got how that much, done. Uh, how, uh, before the flight here, Henry, how much time did you log on the uh, Aerolite? Uh, six to six to ten hours. Six to ten hours, and then then you started off on the long trip. Then I got 21 hours. After he was comfortable in the pattern, we started doing uh, some uh, pilotage trips where I would take him up in the Cessna. In the Cessna. Okay. In the Cessna, and we would go between nearby familiar airports between Warrington and Middleburg, Middleburg and uh, Winchester, and between those three airports that he had flown millions of times in the, in the Cessna. So it was purely visual, uh, uh, but now he's just the idea of taking off from one airport and landing at another. Um, so we, we got, that's how we started to uh, bridge that gap. And there's, there's a, 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 a ridge between Middleburg and uh, Winchester. Uh, okay, I well, gave you and, some good experience for the ultimate trip, which was over the Appalachians, right? Yeah, well, it was a primer. You know, we went uh -huh. over that and, um, he uh, he went right down the center of the gap, which, as it turns out, is probably not the best it's way the to go because that's right. where the Venturi effect, all right, the all right. the wind picks up there. So, I put on the brakes at that point, and we flew out to Colorado to Aspen ah. Flying School, and uh, we took a mountain. Both of us took a, a mountain flying course, uh, you know, in the Rocky Mountains. And I figured that a uh, flying in the Rocky Mountains would be somewhat akin to flying an aerolite at uh, uh, through ah, the Appalachians. Your logic. Okay. You know, like that makes it, sense. That that then pre pre was was the pre preparation for what we would then do next is fly over the Appalachians and get into you know into western Ohio and Indiana. Three, Potomac but, to Bedford, you had a couple ridges you had to go over. How did you get over some of those ridges? I I, just, I had to circle around and gain altitude before I hit the downdraft. Well, part of his concern in that case was there is you know, our airports were spaced out at about 30 miles. Right. And one turn is a, uh, a significant portion of his fuel. So yeah. Yep. You know, he was busy getting over those mountains. Um, but when we, when we landed in Bedford, he was like, that was pretty uh, hair raising, you know, that, those <laughs> that right? the up and down drafts, you know, coming in there. Um, so if you broke the trip into a couple different pieces, it was the prior to the mountains was the first piece, you know, all of the airports, and the scenery that he was used to. Ah, yeah, familiar you know? ground. Yeah. Then the hardest part of the trip came next was getting over the mountains. You know, and as we talked about all the the up drafts and down drafts, but the airport spacing in the mountains is not uh, it's not as plentiful as yeah. airports sure. in the mountains as it is in the plains. So we had to take a quite a circuitous route around the mountains to avoid both the altitude of the mountains. I wanted to go over the least amount of mountains I had to. For him, you know, I should say, he had to go over the least amount through the least. You're wind, playing his yeah, action, right? Yeah. Right. His the, the least amount of windmill farms that he had to go through. <laughs> oh yeah, that's uh, another little danger, isn't it? Right. You know, I mean, flying through the windmill farms. Yeah, you know, those, and those things are big. Yep. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, also avoiding air, airspace because in a 103 you can't go in virtually any airspace other right. than E and G and not even the E to surface airspace surrounding class whatever other airport. Right. So we had to make several calls ahead to get permission to go in a couple of... Uh, yeah, you can, but you've yeah, got to yeah, give advance yeah. notice. For it. It, one of the requirements was that, does he have a radio? And he had a handheld radio with a little antenna that stuck out the top, and he called in. The way, the way I tracked him was Garmin inReach. It sent me his position every two minutes. So after we got over the mountains, it... Uh, from a terrain standpoint, it was clear sailing. You know, it wasn't really anything to deal with. Well, it was rolling hills for a while, yeah, right? Yeah, just had a little bit of a, uh, yeah, the rolling hills had a little bit of uh, turbulence, but not as much as the full on mountains. What yeah. was your average flying speed? Like sometimes I get 55 knots ground speed, but I'd only be going uh, 60, 60 miles per hour on my airspeed indicator. All right, so, but that's enough. You have straight lines and everything else, and you can always beat your dad. Yeah. Yep. Well, especially through western Ohio and eastern Indiana, 
there wasn't a straight road in sight. So, <laughs> and I'm towing a, a trailer around, oh. which was the idea to get them back. Um, and I, I, I was always going through the mountains trying to find a way, which caused some troubles because I didn't have cell phone reception. And and oh, yeah. so I didn't think of that. But. My my, even though he had cell phone reception at all times because he was like in perfect, you know, sure, cell phone. Sure. Yeah, you're in the ideal spot. Um, when I would lose him on cell phone, my backup was the in reach. I could still see him ah, okay, on okay, the in reach. Okay. So sure, I, that's going satellite. Right. So yeah. I still knew where he he was progressing. You know, uh, I could I knew where he was going, and I knew where, like for example, there you was. You knew what the plan was. Right. So. The dot keeps moving in that direction. <laughs> okay. But he he he, he uh, navigated like a laser beam. You know, he, every time directly to there without without a, a, a wiggle at all. You and know, how are you doing your navigating, Henry? Uh, using a Garmin 196, it's just on the, uh, just a line, you know, and follow the line. Yeah. Follow the magenta line, huh? We also, uh, as a backup, uh, we had a, the Garmin D2 Delta watch. Okay. So we plugged the waypoints in both of them. And I, I would say, because I did all the, I said, this is your next waypoint, say KABZ, whatever. And he would plug it in, and then I said, what is that airport? Oh, uh, oh. I said, what's that airport? And he would say, it's this airport. Because I needed to hear him say that ah, it's see, the right okay, airport. I see. You knew what it was. You right. were just looking for feedback. Because it's in his database, both on his watch yeah, okay. and on, on the Garmin 196. It's in the database. I just made, how many miles is it away? You know, okay. what direction What direction does it tell you to go? Um, do your, does your watch and your GP, uh, does your watch and the 196 uh, agree? You know, so this was sort of a parody that we did before each flight okay. to make sure that all of his stuff was pointing in the right direction. So we got through the rolling hills and onto the plains, and we met a lot of fantastic people along the way. We when it landed at one airport, I have to go back and figure out which one it was. They had an outdoor grill slash restaurant that was happening there, and when he landed, they all sort of gravitated around him. He was there a half an hour before I was there, <laughs> and so they all moved out to talk to him, and they all bought us dinner. You know, we got. You Is know, that right? Yeah, cool. they, they bought us cool. dinner. They all want to talk to us. When I left, he was he was just on his departure of that runway. Everybody in the restaurant was stood up with their with their um, cell phone cameras, all uh, videoing him as he left. Is that right? It was the most interesting thing there. <laughs> and when when we were uh, when we were eating there, airplanes were coming and going. You know, normal GA aircraft were coming and going. They they didn't raise an eyebrow. You know, <laughs> but when this guy in a, uh, a lawn chair, you know, took off and, and, you know, flew out of there. They were all quite impressed. After we got through the rolling hills, it became plains, and we hit Kankakee, and that's where we got stuck. Oh, yeah. We, got some, is that where you got uh, doused? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I got, I got a little doused there. Yeah, I heard you were pretty wet, actually, right? Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> it, it started at the shoulders, and I thought, I mean, my jacket's pretty water, it's, it's water resistant, and but, you know, it soaked through, and it went to... Uh, everywhere, then, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty yeah, reasonable, yeah, though. Yep. And good for you for getting through yeah. that, too. So, okay, so now you, you're in Kankakee. Yep. And, so we, uh, and you got wet. Yep. So when I called him, I said, How's the visibility? Because that was one of my oh, typical yeah, questions. Sure. He says, One mile. Ooh. That's not very far. And I was like, One mile? Yeah. You know, are you sure? So I, I quickly called the ATIS of Kankakee. And they said, Three miles of visibility. I'm like, Well, it's probably three miles. But then I went and looked at the video of it, and I'm like, <laughs> that, look, right, that, huh? that does look like one mile. Um, because, He's got good eyes, I'm guessing. Because there so. was a, a front that was coming in, and he was getting soaked, and he had to lift up his glasses because his glasses were right? getting all wet, um, and he landed in the rain. Um, but I said, do you have the airport in sight? He says, yeah, I've got the airport in sight. So uh, then then I was like, okay, because if it, if it was any worse, we'd have to turn around and yeah, sure. do a 180 and get out of there. Um, and you had such contingency plans, I'm guessing? Well, that's why we did 35-mile trips because it was possible then to fly all the way back to go all the way back to where we started to the to the start point he took off to our next destination which was one of our longer legs this was like a 38 mile leg um, and it, it had been going good so far it seemed like it would work but when he got up in the air we talked on the phone he says my ETA says 50 uh, 55 minutes or something yeah 55 minutes Wow. Um, and so this that, is on the Garmin 196. Yeah, on the Garmin. Yeah. Okay. And that was beyond our 
predetermined cutoff of 50 minutes. Ah, you ah, know? Okay, that was your that was your magic number. Right. Your so, go no go number. Right. So if he okay. took off and it said something less than 50 minutes, we're good. You continue. Okay. So I said, well, Henry, come back. So he turned around and came back. Well, you were smart. You did the right thing. As as a group, you planned well and you executed well. So we came back and. Uh, so a couple of folks at the airport says, hey, there's this grass strip that, that uh, gliders go out of, and it's over there. You know, it, it, it turned out to be 15 miles into five this, miles. well, five, five miles. miles. Yeah. Was it only five, five miles? Okay, so it was five miles in. So it was a really short trip, you know, to this. But it was enough uh, to change the, the 50 minutes to 48 minutes. Uh -huh. okay. So All he right. flew to this grass strip. You got strip. some good advice there, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So I fueled him up there, he took off, and now it was, it was super flat planes everywhere, because now we had circled around. Like a billiard table, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, we circled around the west side of, yeah, uh, the west side of Chicago. The, the, the ETA was correct, so then we, we knocked off, I think, six more stops that day. We were okay. in Fond du Lac, and I'm guessing around noon, ah. um, because we had made a bunch of trips that morning, and I was like, well, it's good, let's go, let's go, and we kept on just filling it up with gas and going. <laughs> when we got to Fond du Lac, the weather was already, uh, it was, the winds were about seven knots when he landed in Fond du Lac, and they were increasing to eight, nine, 10, 12, uh -huh. and they were just getting more and more as the afternoon went by. Normally it kind of goes down. Yeah, well that weather was afternoon. coming in about then, I'm guessing. So huh? I said, Henry, uh, you know, the weather looks bad this evening, and it looks really bad tomorrow, and uh, we might be stuck here for a couple days. He said, yeah, what? so close. But. Yeah, <laughs> like right next to it. I said, he said, I said, what do you want to do? He said, what's the weather look like right now? I said, well, you could go right now, but he said, let's do it. All right, good for you. So uh, he he plugged in his frequencies. He says, what's ground? He, I, I told him what ground was. He says, what's tower? <laughs> and I told him what tower, and he says, what's the ATIS? And I told him what the ATIS was. And he's plugging them in because he has a little memory in his, sure, in sure. his uh, 550. And so he plugs them in and uh, I say, you okay? He says, fine, and he goes. And, you know, I, I was, uh, I suppose this is the moment in every father's relationship with their son, <laughs> when you go, well, get out of their way, you know, because right. he's, he's doing the, he's, he's, he knows what he's doing. He's already you proven know, it, he's got it. So. You know, if, if I were to rewind to the beginning of the trip, one of our early, we landed at Martinsburg Airport, which is a, a class Delta controlled oh, airspace okay. airport. We've cut prior permission and so forth. but. He was a little bit shaky on the radio and, you know, kind of uh, apprehensive about talking to Martin yeah. Berg yeah, all, all together. Here he was just he plowed right in here. He says, I, uh, you know, Oshkosh Tower, this is a, a Aerolite 103. Uh, I'm five miles out, inbound for landing. And they're like, well, okay. And I, I couldn't hear everything from, but I was going as fast as I could. But uh, I saw his little dot continue, line up for 3-6. And that's when I that's send you. That, that's me, when yeah. I send you. I think on final. That you was know. so cool. I was so, writing the article about your travels, right well, when your dad texted me. So I added that right in, right at the end of the article. He just told me he's on approach. So yeah. very cool. So he approached here, and we taxied up here. There was, there was nobody. Yeah, here, right. You know. I saw your first picture. Yeah. As it always does. Yeah. Nothing going on two days before. Right. Then it explodes into a show. Yeah. So, uh, and here we are. And here you are. At the biggest air show in the galaxy. Well, thanks so much for talking to us. Uh, we want to give the uh, website for the uh, company here, which go to onefly103.com to learn more about the Aerolite, learn all kinds of things about all sorts of affordable aviation on bydanjohnson.com. Thanks for joining William Scott, Henry Scott, the pilot, and Alina Scott, the helper-in-chief, we'll yep. call her. Yep. And congratulations once again on a wonderful flight and well done.